they were bemused by all they had seen. And last week I tried to examine with us the plight in which these men found themselves. And during my preparation I discovered from my life, I cannot tell you, depression does not happen overnight. It happens in more or less in sequence of events, days, moments, and then it's a reaction or an experience or a display of our lives in the way we respond. I, I possibly would want to suggest that there are three things from these readings. Last week and the week before and the week before and the week before we were in John's Gospel. This week we are in Luke. Next week we are going to begin to develop the fabric through which we can develop the backbone to walk with Jesus. To, be, to climax in the whole aspect of understanding who Jesus is and to have a vision of his transfigured life, empowering us to commitment. Without the foundation, we would be left without anything to hang on to. But I'll take you there, don't worry. Next week I'll begin that journey in the light of the gospel. But Luke takes another part of what happened on the day of resurrection. So last week was day of resurrection, which we call Low Sunday, and attendance in church was usually low because Easter is the highest celebration. And after that, everybody feels a little tired. We've had too many services. We've had service on Sunday and Holy Week and all of that and all of that. Holy Saturday, men. Easter, let's sing and let's forget. What's in the reactions of the disciples? Is a reflection of our own lives after all. When we have participated and been involved, we have been decorating the church, cleaning the church, cleaning all these you tell us these things that we use elements and implements in the altar, changing altar cloth and everything. But it's time to have a prayer. But I noticed that sometimes in our lives, the depression is caused A, by disappointment, B, by distractions, and three, by burnout. Disappointment is what we are looking at in the life of these disciples. And possibly the distractions, what, where, where was their focus? You and I will agree that when we possibly have expectations and the expectations seem to have dis dissipated into nothingness, we fall into a state of sad feelings, we become extremely sad. Someone you love dies, and the death brings a lot of disappointment, especially with children who have anchored upon their parents. This past week I was speaking with a young lady who has lost both parents, and she says, I can't cope. And she started crying, depressed. These disciples have gone to the graveyard, as I told you last week. The grave is empty. If the storm was there, they would have gone back to the familiar place. And so today's gospel picks up with the guys who have experienced it all. And they were going back to their familiar place. They were going to emails. Seven miles from Jerusalem where all these things are taking. And sometimes, you know, if you're in the company of someone who has gone through experiences, workplace experience, disappointments in life through the loss of something, or someone who had great expectations and suddenly demoted a fire from their job, if you meet them, the conversation centers around the activities. Sometimes the focus is not on the result of the activities, but rather the activities themselves. And so, the more they talked about it, the more they would feel like they were supporting each other. And so, someone was lost, someone meet someone was lost, someone they are talking, and suddenly they begin to find that, okay, our story is different. But possibly, reactions and experiences 
they differ as well. They were there when the women came and said, the grave is empty. And Luke tells us they, they had not the foggiest idea of this resurrection thing that Jesus was talking about. They were flat, in other words. <clears throat> and so the best thing to do when you are flat is to go back to a familiar place. It's not so? Mm -hmm. mm. Places that we know. Go back to the mail, seven miles away. Fatigue has entered. The routine has deprived them of the joy. Their disappointments was inexplainable. They, they were just burned out. Totally burned out. Everything you've been there, don't get too far in that. Because many who get there and stay there commit suicide or end up in silence. Because persistent depression leads to breakdown in our capacity to deal with the normalcy of things, and everything around us becomes extremely sad. And so, in their plight, they were going back to the familiar. Like the children of Israel, when they came through the desert and they began to experience difficulties mm -hmm. and they began to curse and swear on Moses. Mm -hmm. Hey, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you brought us to, into the desert to die here? Let's go back to Egypt. Mm -hmm. We could blame these guys, but sometimes even in our church experiences, God begins to do a new thing. We are not familiar. And we begin to bemoan and cry and wail. Let's go back to the old days. We used to do it this way. We feel comfortable. We feel so amazed by what had happened in the past. We forget that when we drive, we have a, a mirror that shows us what we have passed. But if we keep looking there, we will crash. And some of us keep looking at the past and we fail to see the direction into which God wants to take us. Even in our individual lives, that's it. our failures become the center of focus, what we have not done. Or possibly the joy and pleasure we enjoyed in the times past. And these two guys were telling their story. What I find interesting is that when Jesus or God says, I will be with you all the time. It's true. The problem about many of us is that we don't recognize where he's there. That's all. But he's never leave, he never leaves us, nor forsake us. And I find it amazing because sometimes the distractions deprive me of feeling that God is with me. Do I make sense? The distraction. I'm looking at my circumstances rather my confidence in the God that I have placed my life in. These disciples, including these two guys, were so mesmerized by the circumstances that they failed to focus on the promises that God has made that he was going to rise again from the dead. But what I like about this passage, their inability to recognize Jesus was determined by God because God sometimes allows us in those situations of our possibly blindness to manifest his glory in the place of it. And God has a process of doing that. Do I make sense? He has a process of doing it. And, and, and it begins somewhere. And one of the things I find out is Jesus' method of evangelism in before he died and after he rose from the dead. He comes to them they are talking, and the first thing he does, he listens to them. He immerses into their conversation, but does not allow it to overwhelm him. Sometimes we get involved in conversations and we take over and we suffer emotionally. We become like part of it, rather than listening for a window to bring about a place of hope. You know what I'm talking about? Those little things that we are talking about. So he comes and he's listening to them. He asks a question. When you are not sure where people are, always ask a question. What are you talking about? 
And then they said to him, Are you the only stranger here who does not know what has happened with Jesus? Who was a prophet and a man of mighty deeds? Everyone, irrespective of the positions we find ourselves, everyone, the God image in us contains a capacity to remind us about a God who loves us and a God who created. When we deny that, we go further into depression. Let me help you out quickly. I'm not preaching this morning, I'm teaching, so forgive me. <clears throat> so, you take their conversation, they are frustrated, burn out, they are disappointed. We had hoped, that's the word. We had hoped, I had hoped that this man would give me all the joy I need. I had hoped that my wife would give me all the joy I had hoped. It didn't work in that way. Because you know why? If we look at the benefits without the process, we might miss it. Yes, it may be all the best for us, but possibly we are distracted and we don't focus in the inner person that we are dealing with or the situation we find ourselves. And then we get confused. So after they had spoken, he listened to them. And then he began to open scripture to them, beginning with the prophets and even to the act of dying and burial and resurrection. Still, they were limited in it. What I find out important is that God honors his word. Amen? Amen? Because the word of God is our authority for living a life with God. There's no other way. I see that now we talk about the Bible, we go to the word Holy Bible. When we were growing up, we were told, Holy Bible. A set apart book to instruct us so that we can walk in the line that God wants us to walk. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So Jesus brings them to the content for conviction, in other words, began to speak to them about scripture. If we live our lives without scripture, we cannot survive. A capacity within us that only God can satisfy. Do I make sense? Mm -hmm. So instead of going to the source, you know, it's like you buy a machine and you're given an instructor's book, which many of us are guilty of. We buy a new phone, we don't look, read the book to find out everything. <laughs> we want to discover as, as we go along. Okay. And then sometimes we find the thing is not working, we take it back to this. To the dealers who say, it's not working. They said, did you read the book? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you are lying. <laughs> and the person takes this little machine from you. He says, oh, you failed to do one, two, three, four, five. Mm -hmm. And they go through one, two, three, four, five, and the dark screen changes mm -hmm. and shows some light. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. And Jesus was doing exactly to them. Yes, there is something that you need to understand. That yes, if you know what God had promised, yes, if you know what the Bible says, if you know, yes, because all scripture is given by God and is profitable for correction, for teaching, for reproving, for training in righteousness, so that the man or the woman of God can be thoroughly equipped for every moment. Today's church wants to live for God but do not want to spend time in scripture. And that's why we are depressed. That's why pastors like us are committing suicide. Because we are trying to find solution from the world to satisfy the problem that is internal and is eating us. I want to suggest to us this morning, the Bible, I, I, I grew up singing this song, the best book to read is the Bible. If you read it every day, it will guide you on your way. The best book to read is the Bible. So Jesus was giving the Bible study. Hallelujah. And you know what Bible study does to us? It begins to tickle some fire in us. Because I, how do I know that the guy said, did not our hearts burn within us while he spoke with us? Did not our hearts burn within us while he spoke with us? Hallelujah. 
Well then, Jesus walks with them, talks with them, and leads them into a level, different level. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. So he is bringing them now, burning the drosses of their lives, creating a sense of hope from their frustrated life. But he did not force them to understand. God uses his word, not our arguments, to bring about conviction. Again, today's church will quote all the professors, all the this, all the that, and then even go to social media of possibly movies that are created by people who have nothing to do with God's church. Instead of going back to the Bible. So this ladies is dropping in the conversation. <laughs> and they hear me all the time. Well, if they are recording it somewhere, this is great. Hallelujah. <laughs> they will hear the authority of God. <laughs> so let me walk with you in the next three minutes. So they were tired, exhausted, frustrated, going back to the place of familiarity. But then something happens. God breaks through in our lives sometimes through hospitality we offer. Amen. Amen. Jesus wanted to continue. And you know, in our church today, we have that to break through into many lives. If we could only let them know we can help them to provide accommodation, feeding, and other things. That's what these two guys did in their frustration. This man has been telling them something that they, uh, they do not even understand. But then they get to their destination. Sir, don't continue, it's dark. Stay here till tomorrow morning. And then you can continue. Sir, here's a cup of water. I see you are thirsty. Mom, I see you are naked. Mom, I see you are... You are overworked. Can I help you with the children for just one hour or two hours? Can you take some break out of it? And possibly the scale of their eyes can drop because their focus can change. But what I find interesting from this um, um, act of kindness is that Jesus comes and there is a little liturgy in what happens there. Normally, the host must say prayer over the food. But once they present bread, Jesus takes the bread. He gives thanks. He breaks the bread. He gives to them. Their eyes were open. Word and liturgy. Amen? Amen. Because liturgy without the word becomes just a ritual. Because its foundation and its root that is intended is minimized by the ignorance or possibly the distraction from its place of context. And we depend only on content. That instead of spending time with the context, what happened that created this, we look at the form and then we miss it and it becomes mere ritual. What I want to offer to us this morning, every time we come to God's house and bread is broken and given to us, is to energize us and to, br to bring us to realizing the depths of Jesus dying on the cross. As often as you do this, you do so in remembrance of me. It's not a ritual. It becomes ritual, more of ritual when we begin to talk about just what, how to do it, rather than the context. When we begin to look at the content without the context, we miss it, we fail to recognize it. When we look at the content, the, 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 the content instead of the context, it becomes mere ritual. We come to it, but nothing happens. But I, I have good news for you. They received it, and their eyes were open. Hallelujah. These wicked, tired, depressed men, 
are transformed because of the new insight and energy that God gives in the broken bread and but preceded by the explanation of the word <laughs> through the word of God. These tired men walked again seven miles and they met the disciples still behind closed doors and they told them. They were explaining what had happened. They were not there when Jesus appeared to them. When Peter was in there, but they came back bearing testimony because I want to confess to you, anyone to whom Jesus has made himself known, either through the word or the broken word, never gets depressed. They are energized into new things and into new places. Did not our hearts burn within us? Burning hearts is not enough. So um, Peter in the, new, in the first reading this morning, filled with the Holy Ghost, began to proclaim this Jesus who was crucified, died, buried, and rose again. And as he went into the world, conviction is created. They asked a question like Jesus asked, what must we do? They said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sin. When the word is preached, God's spirit is at work. When the word of God is preached, God's power is available. When the word of God is preached, converts are made into the church. And so 3,000 were added. Hallelujah. Amen. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.